first part of the talk, which is about um, real-time sensors using social media. Um, much of the work that I'm presenting here, at least in terms of the techniques, um, we published them at the Journal of Population and Development Review um, in 2017. So let me start off by talking about census. And since I'm most familiar with the census in the US, let me talk a little bit about that. Um, so census is something that is conducted in every country. Um, particularly in the US, it's interesting that actually the US Constitution requires enumeration of census or enumeration of the population. And it is the decennial census, which is conducted every 10 years ever since the founding of the US in 1790. And since then, many other um, countries have adopted um, similar thing. Now, an interesting question is, now an interesting uh, question here might be, why is it that people even bother gathering census? Why is it interesting to enumerate um, the entire population? Well, the originally the intent of the um, of the framers of the US Constitution was that if you are going to make policies and you want to understand the impact of policies on the world, on, on your country, you actually need to get very good census. Um, that is, get factual data to evaluate the impact of policies. Now, since then, of course, there have been a ton of innovations. Initially, they used to just ask for some basic demographic information, men, whether your gender and your race and so on. And since then, um, the census in many of these countries started getting longer and longer. In fact, it's actually called the long form. It has like tons and tons of questions that it asks about people. Um, and um, since 1940s, people started realizing it's really a dumb idea to really to enumerate every single uh, person in the population, at least for all the features. In fact, you could do sampling techniques and subsample a random population to, if you wanted to learn something about um, the census. And starting in 1990s, they, they started doing something called rolling census. The difference between rolling census and decennial census is rather than wait for the next 10 year cycle to figure out what the next um, uh, set of uh, data looks like, why not actually have um, subsample some part of the population every month um, so that you do keep, you have like this rolling um, data pouring in at the level of every month for some part of the population. And then you can just do your uh, sliding window based computations of those census. Okay. And this is actually called the American um, Community Survey, which is the ACS. Now, I'm going to, it, it's going to feel like a radical departure and I will try to connect up both these things. Next, I'm going to talk about Facebook ad platform. Um, now, it's by far, uh, Facebook is the largest social media platform in terms of number of users um, and in terms of the amount of data that it aggregated about the users, um, in terms of advertisers and the ad revenues as well, as well as in terms of novel targeting practices. Now, the interesting thing about Facebook is it gathers a ton of information about all of us. And since huge fraction of the entire um, population in the world today is on Facebook, at least in certain countries. Um, Facebook has actually a ton of data about um, the user populations, right? Now, this data is actually not available to you if you try to ask it, but if you sign up as an advertiser on Facebook, Facebook is willing to open up its books and say, hey, who do you want to target, right? And so in, if you want to understand or get at the data that Facebook has, the best way you should you should be doing is not by crawling Facebook or something. You should sign up as an advertiser and they will tell you all the data that they have because they hope that they'll get the money by you advertising, right? And so that's the basic idea. Uh, now, the, I'm going to focus primarily on the Facebook ad platform, but pretty much every other social media site out there also has similar ad um, platforms. And so you can sign up as an advertiser on any of them and get this data, right? So as you might already know, um, whenever you log into Facebook, the way Facebook makes money is by showing you ads of various different things, either in the newsfeed or on the sidebar, right? Now, the interesting thing for us is actually focusing on the data that is used for targeting ads, right? And Facebook gathers a ton of features about every user um, in order to enable advertisers to target them. Um, so for instance, in fact, Facebook categorizes these features into three different categories. Some things are known as demographic um, data. Another thing is interest, and another thing is behaviors. Now notice that in demographics, it has information like your education, your, um, your um, uh, life events, um, whether you're parents, whether you're married, and these kinds of things, including your financial data. And in interest, it tries to understand, Facebook tries to understand whether you're interested in technology or sports and various different subcategories under them. And under behaviors, it'll try to understand um, whether you are, um, for instance, uh, an expat or whether you, what type of purchasing behaviors you have and so on. Now, the interesting thing is Facebook has 
if you look at the total column, Facebook for every single person on Facebook, Facebook tries to infer about 614 different attributes of you. Okay. Now, in addition to this, what Facebook does, at least in certain countries, is it links up these online profiles, the online data, with the offline data. Offline data is data that credit card companies um, and banks collect about you, right? So there are these companies like Axiom, Epsilon, uh, Expedient, Data Logics. These are very large, um, uh, what are traditionally thought of as offline data brokers. They gather a ton of information, and these are the ones that generate your credit scores and so on. And Facebook, what it has done, at least in certain countries, is connected up both the things. So you might think that you're online and you're anonymous, but actually if you're living in the US or Germany, there's a pretty good chance that your um, offline um, credit profiles have been connected to your online profiles. And all this data is available for advertisers to target you with that. Okay? Now, to just give you a, a bit of a closer look at the kind of granularity at which Facebook infers data. Um, so for instance, in terms of demographical data, there is a field called relationship, which is a, uh, and within relationship, it tries to categorize everybody, whether they're interested in men or women or, or both men and women and so on. And in terms of status, Facebook tries to infer whether you're separated, widowed, open relationship, divorced, married, so on. You get the picture. It has very, very detailed information about all of us. Um, now each user, uh, feature is actually a Boolean variable. It has either, um, you are, it either sets it as zero or one kind of thing. I mean, in terms of, to give you another uh, demographical feature, uh, the kind of things that they aggregate from data brokers. Uh, for instance, in Germany, um, everybody is either put into four different um, income bins. Like Facebook knows whether they're earning between 2,000 and 2,600 euros or whether you're earning more than 5,000 euros and so on. So these are the kinds of um, data and the granularity at which Facebook knows about our lives. Now I know that some of you may be getting creeped out by how much data Facebook aggregates about all of us. So there is a different talk um, that I, where I point out all the privacy issues with it. Um, but in this talk, I'm going to say, let's ignore the privacy issues for a second and let's see what we can do uh, with it for uh, improving demographic research, right? Or, or um, um, getting some census data out of it. Um, now, in terms of the amount of data it aggregates um, across different countries, um, the, you notice that Facebook infers a lot of features um, based on your behaviors on the platform itself. In certain countries like US and UK, and even in Germany, they try to connect up with their offline profiles. Luckily, in India, at least, um, I don't, we haven't seen Facebook connecting it with offline um, data, like your credit scores and other kinds of stuff. Now, in terms of how Facebook um, advertisers target users, so what they do is advertisers specify a Boolean formula over the features. That's needlessly geeky terminology, uh, but excuse me for a second. So basically what they do is, if you want to target some users, you say, I want to target everybody who has feature one, feature two, and feature three, and so on, okay? Now, users are targeted whenever the feature vector that Facebook inferred for you, whenever it satisfies the formula, you get targeted. So let's do a quick, let me show you a quick demo of how easy it is to get census. And I thought to do this, I will risk doing a live demo of trying to understand census of IIT Kharagpur, right? So this is my Facebook uh, page. So signing up as an advertiser is ridiculously simple. All that you have to do is, you see that ad thing over there? Maybe this is too small of a font. You just click on that ad thing. That means you want, I'm telling Facebook that I want to launch an ad. You can do this on your, um, Facebook pages as well. Okay, now it's asking me what type of an ad that I want to run. Let's say I want to target some ad for reach, reaching people. And then it wants me to set up an account. I will pretend that uh, I would want the account country to be India. Um, and the currency is in Indian rupees, time zone Kolkata, perfect. Um, Okay, that's it. I'm now signed up as an advertiser to launch the ad, and so I can start looking at, Facebook will start telling me uh, information about people that I want to target. So the first thing here is, can you guys see the font at all? Um, what's the key thing for uh, command shift plus? Okay, good, perfect. So notice that the interesting thing is Facebook is saying, um, is talking about, um, it gives some data about how many people I can target, right? So right now it, I, 
this one says I'm trying to target everyone in Germany, but that's not what I want. I want to target people in Kharagpur. So let's say I want to target people in Kharagpur, Kharagpur, West Bengal city, perfect. Uh, this one is 25 miles, this is too big. I want to reduce it, uh, 10 miles, okay. Now Facebook nicely shows in this thing, I guess this is IIT campus. So let me just drop a pin on it saying that I want to understand target people in the IIT campus. Pardon? <laughs> so and then with IIT campus, beautifully I can even target for within one square mile. So now I put a pin on uh, IIT campus and I want to target people within this IIT campus. By the way, how many people do you think are in the IIT campus? right? So Facebook, um, oops, hold on a second. I have to target only those. So Facebook says there are about 29,000 people, right, in IIT campus, right? Now if I want to understand certain demographics, let's say we want to figure out, oops, we want to figure out how many men versus women are there. Any guesses? What fraction of these would be men versus women? Ratio? Nine to 10, uh, let's see. So remember these numbers, you have to do some quick math. It's men is 22,000 out of the 29,000 are men, right? So what's that? That's 75% or something, right? Um, now you want to understand say ages, right? You want to understand how many of these guys are young, right? So how many of them 29,000 people are say between ages of 16, that's when people enter or 17, I, I have to admit it. It's been so long since I've been in IIT and say, 30, right? How many people do you think will be, be will be less than age 30 out of 29,000, right? 20,000, right? So you can get these numbers. Now you can even, um, let's pull it back to more than 65. So you can see, you can get the age demographics as well. Now you can even see like how many of them maybe ever used Bengali on this on the site. Like for instance, you type in Bengali, um, it'll tell you, okay, 10,000 people. Um, have used Bengali on the site, right? And then you can go into all the 500 different attributes that I talked about. So for instance, you want to know how many people are married, um, just go in. The important thing is that number that, I, that is being shown over there, right? So you want to understand demographics, say um, how many of them are parents, uh, maybe relationship, right? Relationship status. How many people are married out of these 29,000 people? 3,800 people, not that many. Um, um, you can see other complicated relationships that people might have as well. You can get those these things. Um, and then for instance, you can get their interests. Let's say, let's type in computer science, how many people are interested? What fraction of these people do you think would have interest in computer science? Of course, this, this is what Facebook thinks that you're interested. So we have to take it with a grain of salt, right? Um, so about 2,900 people, 10% of the population. Let's see machine learning. Um, Two thousand what? 2,600, okay. Most of the people who are interested in computer science are also interested in machine learning kind of thing. Now, you can go crazy at this point. You can see how many of them are interested in various different political parties. Like we could see like how many of them are interested in Modi, for instance. Um, it will show it, right? Narendra Modi, okay. 9,100 people, at least doesn't mean that they support him. It means that they're interested in pages related to him. You could see like for instance, Rahul Gandhi say, for instance, It's fewer than 1,000 people. You can, <laughs> you can check for other political parties. You can even look at like, for instance, um, depending on how crazy you wanna go, you can look for ideologies. Like for instance, how many of these people actually are interested in say, Hindutva? 1,700 people. And Facebook gives you other suggestions for what you can see as, okay, if you want to see how many of the people are interested in RSS, all these kinds of numbers. And you can get a ton of data about people um, and their interests from these kinds of things. So hopefully 
you got a feel for um, the kinds of things that you could do with it, right? Now the question is, of course, it's throwing out some numbers. Are these numbers at all um, accurate um, sort of a thing? Now, unfortunately, I don't know how accurate these numbers are for India, but I can show you some data now on how accurate they are for the US because um, we have some, and as well as certain things about the, the certain other countries in the world as well, because when you have actual census data, you compare it with it, with Facebook data, you can see how good or how accurate it is, right? So what I'm showing here, the first one is the ACS. ACS is the American Community Survey. This is the one that I pointed out in the first slide as a rolling survey. And what we're showing here in this graph is a scatter plot. X-axis shows, so basically there are in the US, um, the entire country is divided into 3,000, around 3,000 counties. Um, and so each, for each county is represented by a dot. And we're looking at the actual population in the county as estimated by ACS along x-axis, and y-axis, oh sorry, y-axis is the population estimated by ACS, x-axis is the population estimated by Facebook, right? That means these are the Facebook users in there, right? Now, of course, if everybody in the population was on Facebook, they would all um, lie along the diagonal, but clearly not everybody is on Facebook, but you could see to what extent um, the correlation holds. So in the US, around 75 to 80% of the entire population is on those things. Right? Now, of course, you see that there are certain dots below the, um, the diagonal. It's kind of spooky because how can there be more people on Facebook than there are in the actual population? Maybe there are fake accounts or, or other sorts of things in those specific counties. Now, this is for the total population. And um, in fact, what um, I'm showing there is the rank correlation. That means suppose if you ordered all the counties based on their population on Facebook versus based on their population in the actual American community survey, how correlated are the two rankings of these 3,000 different counties? And the ranking correlation is actually quite high as well. It's a similar kind of a plot for men and women, men in shown in blue and women in pink. Okay, and once again, there is a fair bit of correlation. So I'm going to show you a bunch of these graphs. There is nothing deep about these graphs beyond showing how well they correlate. So I will skip through them in a pretty reasonable pace um, or a quick pace. Once again, the ranking correlations, when you do it, they're quite strong, okay? Then we also looked at the ethnicity. Um, yep. Oh, yes, yes. So right now, what I showed you is completely for free, right? So I just set it up. Like, in fact, you can do the same thing that... Yes. Yeah, so there is an API. Um, so Facebook has an ad API that we were using. Now, to be... I also have to mention that um, we play, because we are in academia, we play both sides. So we also did some work showing how um, violating of privacy this whole API is. In fact, the API has so many holes that you can actually identify very personal information about individual people. So we are actually co helping Facebook fix those privacy problems, but the consequence of that might be that this ad API, which right now is so widely open and where you can actually do the queries very easily without any rate limiting, without any restrictions, in about a month or two, it's going to be much more restricted. So in a strange way, this kind of, um, things that you do may not be possible. However, Facebook does have the data if people want to explore it. Yes. Oh, yes. yes. So we actually, for instance, for all these 3,000 data points, right, we didn't do it manually. My a student wrote a script that would query the Facebook ad API and it would get the statistics from it. No, 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 no. You cannot do it as a time. Um, you have to repeatedly query the API. So um, they, they do some, um, uh, they do add some noise, more as a privacy uh, mechanism, but they add a minimal amount of noise in the estimates that they give. But in terms of do, does Facebook have um, an incentive? Um, in one way you would think they do, but on the other hand, it, they're also, they would also risk the, uh, the trust of advertisers, right, who are paying them money. I mean, if you think of Facebook, it's making all its money through ads, right? So, um, of course, in advertisements, there are, there are well-known things of um, they, the data not being always very solid and valid. But what is striking is when we actually compared with um, American community survey 
things, these are the, in some sense, these are the plots that are validation, right? Like for instance, this is the, um, again, once again, x axis is Hispanic population. Um, suppose if we use the Facebook ad API and we estimated what fraction of Hispanics in each county, um, what fraction of population in each county is Hispanic, x axis is that and y axis is the American Community Survey and once again you see that um, they are pretty well aligned along the, um, the diagonal. Um, and for instance, this is the same thing for African Americans. If you wanted to estimate the percentage of black population in any county, um, how does it line up? And it actually lines up once again very well along the diagonal. I'm just skipping this through quickly because of this. Now, of course, certain communities are very badly or poorly estimated. For instance, Asian population is actually very badly estimated. That's because Facebook's inference, one thing that I haven't talked at, at all about is how is Facebook actually inferring these features? And sometimes if your inference um, is not accurate, then it can go wrong. So in, in certain cases, like for instance, in estimating the Asian population, you see that it's compared to the other ones. This is much more noisy. And it's also because the percentage of people are also, um, as a population of the US, it's, quite, it's kind of small. Now, one other thing that we did was we looked at um, the fraction of expats. Um, so again, each dot here actually represents um, one of the 50 states in the, in the US. And for each one, we looked at what fraction of um, the, the state's population are expats. That means migrants, immigrants versus actual citizens. And you can see that it lines up um, pretty well um, along the, uh, the diagonal. In fact, even if you zoom in on the, on the bottom right corner, it actually zooms fairly well. Now, the only um, comparison that we did with uh, statistics outside of um, the US is with data from World Bank, again about migrants. Um, so once again, the line that we plot there, if a dot lies there, so each dot now is actually a country and the color of the dot represents the continent that it is on. Um, and this is for every country um, which has more than a million um, migrants. We uh, put it on this map. And as you can see, uh, the important thing to keep in mind is um, this data that World Bank obtains or ACS obtains is a very intensive process and it, there's a lot of effort that goes into it. And it's kind of striking um, that Facebook um, has so many people um, on the website and on their site and it knows so much information that you can actually, it actually gets pretty close to this. Now, this is all fine. Um, the question is, uh, can we do something more? Uh, can we do some interesting stuff that you couldn't do with census? Um, kind of thing with Facebook, given that Facebook has a lot more data about each and every individual person. So for, for, for fun, what we did was we looked at how political beliefs of people in the US change with age, right? So for each age category, we put what fraction of them are liberals and what fraction of them are conservatives kind of a thing. There is this very well known saying in the US, once you start paying taxes, you become conservative, right? So as you grow older, um, you tend to become more conservative and you can see that reflected in terms of your belief system. And you're very, very liberal when you're young. You're always socialist, let's tax everyone, let's spread the wealth around kind of a thing. And you can see how it changes. You can even, we, again, these are more for fun, but they also kind of show you the, the depth to which you could go. Um, uh, with these data. So what we did, what we showed here is, um, once again, at what ages are people marrying? And the way we got this information is Facebook has this feature called target people who got married in the last six months. And so you could see how they're distributed um, across, the, at what ages are they getting married? Again, in the US, right? So each line corresponds to a state and the dark blue line corresponds for the whole countrywide thing. Now, you may not be able to see this, but there are some two suspicious looking peaks at the age of 20 to 24, and they correspond to the state of Utah, um, where um, they, they have an interesting religion that is very dominant, and in Idaho, where people seem to be getting married much younger compared to the other states in this thing. Furthermore, you can actually use this to study and understand bias in news media sites, right? So because um, pretty much every news media site is on Facebook, and so you can look at their reader population on Facebook and you can look at how um, their, what their demographics are to understand whether the followers of a media site are biased in a certain way, which might in turn correlate with the actual bias of the media site itself, right? And again, you're doing this, now what we're talking about is, a, is some work that people in, do this in computational journalism where they read a ton of articles to actually evaluate the biases of 
um, various different media sites and I'm just trying to show how you can actually obtain these things very easily. This data was actually part of Abhignan's work with uh, Niloy. Um, so for instance, uh, this is the, uh, this pie chart is actually showing the US population on Facebook and their political uh, beliefs. How many, what fraction of them are very liberal, liberal to very conservative. Now if you look at New York Times, which is one of the more popular news media sites, um, and you look at their uh, distribution of their readers and their political leanings, and you compare the numbers, they're more or less fairly representative of the US population. But once you start going to Fox News, which is a bit more of a conservative leaning channel, you start noticing that the red, which is conservatives, 50% um, of all Fox News readers are actually conservatives or very conservatives. And then there is another very hard um, right news media site called Breitbart. And if you look at the followers of Breitbart, you start noticing that pretty much 85% um, of the, this is a, this is a site that supports Trump, Donald Trump for presidency and, um, and so on. And these are like really, most of their readers are hardcore conservatives and very, um, uh, very, very conservative. So this is just a way of showing the sorts of things you can do. So at this point, I can either stop or go to the second part of the talk, depending on the time that you have. Pardon? I have 20 minutes. 15 minutes, okay. Wait. I suspect that I may be going too fast. Like, are people able to follow? Um, okay. So the, let me just close down the first part of the talk by pointing out that what we have done is basically shown how um, you can actually use ad APIs on all the different social media sites to do demographic research if you're interested. And you can um, get data about people at a granularity that even surveys might struggle to capture because surveys don't have, the long form surveys uh, for census don't ask 600 questions um, about each and every individual person. But Facebook infers a lot of them, okay? That's the takeaway. Now, mm -hmm. sure, if you have a quick question. Or two. Hello, you No, we got. Mm -hmm. And go to uh, the user and then it's spread by word of mouth as it's like that. Is it exactly how many Facebook users are reading that? Yeah. So the, for the Facebook news media, uh, so New York Times has a Facebook page, and we are talking about the set of all people that Facebook inferred as interested in the page. That means these are the people who would be recommended articles from New York Times. If New York Times posts an article, then these are the people who will receive notifications and, and they would be highlighted on their page. So then there is some sort of demographic bias from the right? uh, most users are younger and uh, how yeah. it affects this and so Yes. So there are, there are some biases like that. It's not perfect. Um, um, but at least in certain countries, like in the US, the adoption of Facebook, even amongst the, in fact, I keep hearing that the adoption of Facebook in teenager population is decreasing because too many of their parents are on Facebook. Um, and so they don't, they don't, they no longer get the privacy that they want. Or, oops, okay. Is, is there another quick question? Yes. That I don't know. Um, I, only Facebook designers know it. Like, what do they do when there is a clash? Kind of thing. Good question. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about truth perception biases in social news. Um, if you ask me what's the connection to the previous one, it's very tenuous, but maybe you'll find it interesting. So the topic that we were that we got curious about was fake news stories in social media, and there have been concerns about how fake news is being spread through social media, whether it's WhatsApp or or Twitter or so on. Now, the concerns that people have expressed is two forms. One is that their ad platforms can be used to target particularly vulnerable people. Like for instance, if you want to spread some rumors about um, uh, liberals, um, say, uh, or the liberal parties, you, would, you could target the people who are very conservatives using the Facebook ad platform as I, sh as I showed, and thereby you are actually targeting them precisely. And the second thing is people have um, uh, been pointing out for some time now that in social media, like-minded people network with each other, they connect 
um, with each other, and they don't connect as much to people who, with whom they disagree. And as a result, there is this formation of a filter bubble. You could think of it as a cluster in the information dissemination network, um, whereby people tend to reinforce each other's um, biases, and um, they don't hear the opposing opinions from the other side kind of thing. The, both the social media ad platforms and the, and the filter bubbles are a dangerous combination that makes it easy for fake news stories to be spread um, in a very, very uh, uh, undercover manner without even people recognizing. In fact, um, these things, um, some recent studies have shown they are actually uh, sowing uh, social discord, they're weakening societal consensus, they're leading to people, um, different communities of people distrusting each other, uh, and in fact in the US there's this long-running um, scandal about whether Russia has um, leveraged social media platforms to actually affect the outcomes of the elections. Now there's a lot of, understandably this is a very hot topic and there are lots of people who are looking at quantifying fake news propagation as well as detecting uh, the truth value of a news story potentially in an automated fashion, like using direct content analysis or looking at how these stories are spreading over a network, looking at the patterns of propagation or relying on user reports kind of a thing. Now, now, if you look at how Facebook and Twitter and other companies, they have finally acknowledged that the spread of fake news is a big problem. And if you look at how they're trying to thwart it, that means how they're trying to disrupt the fake news uh, thing, the way they're, going, they're doing this is by allowing readers to report fake stories. So for instance, this is a screenshot of some Facebook post this morning that I took. So Brian Ford is a, is a, is a professor at EPFL, and if, if for every post that you see, you, you see the top right arrow, um, uh, and if you click on that arrow, you could, you will get this bar which says, I want to, you could select that I want to give feedback on the post. So when I selected that, it gives me multiple different options. I can report this as false news or whether, it, uh, or if it contains hate speech or spam or harassment or these kinds of things. Now Facebook essentially gathers these reports and then um, what it does is it uh, then manually fact checks these things because automated fact checking hasn't reached that, uh, that stage yet. And, and so what they, they do is when a post is reported as, say, false news by multiple people, they actually give it to fact checking sites like Snopes and PolitiFact. These are organizations where there are experts who have signed up to verify stories following what is known as a pointer score of principles. It's like a set of principles for being impartial when you're evaluating a story. And then the key thing that Facebook is doing in the whole process is it's basically using the user reports to order the stories in some priority ordering. The reason is manual fact checking is very expensive. So um, you can't just fact check every single reported story. So you have to prioritize it in some way. So they prioritize some stories based on the number of reports, for instance, that they receive. And the, the ones that receive the most reports are the ones that are actually fact-checked. Now what additionally Facebook does, and this is an important point, I'll get back to this afterwards, is if the fact-checking site comes back and says this is a false story, Facebook will label the story as disputed. But if the fact-checking site comes back and says that the story is true, Facebook does nothing because it's a true story. There is no need to label it as, as contentious or disputed, okay? Now, in this talk, what I'm actually going to argue is I'll try to be provocative and argue that it's actually completely pointless to try to evaluate the ground truth value of a story. And instead, what we should actually be evaluating is how do people actually perceive the story. So let me tell you what we did. So what we did was we did a survey where we, um, what we showed was some claims that were fact checked. So for instance, this is a claim that is saying that President Trump changed the name of Black History Month to African American History Month, right? This was a story that was spreading, and then um, we show the story to some um, online uh, users, and we recruit them, and our thinking is to ask people for how they perceive this story. That means without thinking too much, do you think this is likely to be true, or do you think this is likely to be false, kind of a thing. Now, on first glance, it feels like um, truth perception seems to be a very flaky thing, but if you think about it, you encounter a lot of news every single day. And what we wanted to understand or measure was the implicit truth perceptions. That means, suppose if you just had to respond to this claim in just a few seconds without fact checking or without knowing, it's, think of it as a gut check, right? You might vote it as either true or false, right? And that, I'm going to argue, is actually revealing something very, very interesting and deep about the uh, perceptions of truth. Okay, I'll try to convince you of that, that this is actually worth understanding 
how people instinctively perceive a new story. So the data that we gathered for this study is we uh, took three different fact checking sites, Snopes, PolitiFact and Rumors. We selected, so these sites what they do is whenever Facebook reports some claim to them, they fact check it and um, some of them are, and then they label them on a scale of minus one to plus one because sometimes truth is complicated. It's not, it's, it's not always um, minus or, or plus. In fact, sometimes there are half truths and mostly truths and pants on fire false and so on, right? And so we're just, in total we gathered about 390 stories for which we had the ground truth data about what, how true or false they are. And then we surveyed 100 Amazon Mechanical Turk workers that we recruited and what we did is we asked them to take an implicit truth perception test. That means we would show them a story and we would say, you have five seconds, uh, don't think too much, don't do Google search because if you did Google search and so on, you would actually find it out. But what's your immediate perception? Uh, do you think it's true or false, right? Now, um, let me give you a feel for the kinds of uh, stories that we, uh, that we did this test for. To give you a feel for participating on the test, what I would suggest is I'll show you a story and within five seconds, if you think it is true, just raise your hand. Um, and if you think it's false, don't raise, okay? The first story is President Trump inherited a White House infested with cockroaches due to the careless behavior of his predecessor, Barack Obama. How many people think it's true? <laughs> okay, second story. President Donald Trump changed the constitution to read citizens instead of persons. How many people think it's true? Okay, two or three, only a small fraction. Story three. Senator John McCain's vote against kidney repeal healthcare proposal stopped attempts to repeal Affordable Care Act for the fiscal year 2017. This is a hard question unless you're following US politics. So it feels like many people within, um, I'm just eyeballing here about what fraction of you might have, might be from the US and I'm eyeballing that many of you feel like it's, it's actually true. Story four. The national debt, this is the US national debt, saw a surprising decline of $102 billion between 20th January and 27th June of 2017. Um, how many people think that this may be true? A fair number, um, okay. Though now you guys managed to confuse me in terms of like, there were uh, some people that I didn't think might have, might be from the US who are, uh, who are making a decision on this. Okay, some people, some of you think, okay. But these are the kinds of stories and this is the kind of test that we did. Now let me show you the one graph and if you understand this graph very well, then the rest of the thing is just like bells and whistles on top of this and, and adding cherries on top of this. So what I'm showing in this, in this thing is the results from 150 stories from Snopes site, okay? So each dot corresponds to a story and there are 150 stories. X-axis shows the ground truth level of the story that was assigned by fact checkers. So 30 stories have been assigned as, as false and 30 of them have been assigned as true and 30 of them are mostly true, 30 of them are mixtures and 30 of them are mostly false, okay? Um, of course, we picked them and that's why the numbers are so even. And then um, what I'm showing along the y-axis is the average um, truth response um, uh, that we got from the AMT workers. So we asked 100 people and we did, you could think of it as wisdom of the crowd. So some people might say it's true, then it's plus one, my, uh, mostly true, it's 0.5 and then we add them up, we average out, okay? So y-axis is showing the perceived truth level, right? Now the diagonal is the most interesting one because if a story lies along the diagonal, that means the story's um, ground truth has been correctly perceived by the people. Now if a story lies below the diagonal, what it means is people are being cynical about the story. That means it's, the story is actually more true than what people are perceiving it to be. So in other words, if you look at the story S4, that is very high false negative bias, right? It's false negative bias is the thing is actually true, but you're not trusting it, you're being cynical. If a story lies above the diagonal, that means you are being gullible. That means you're believing the story more than what it deserves to be believed. It's the false positive bias, okay? Now, if you were going to fact check stories, which, what should be your priority for fact checking? Which stories would you pick? Would you pick stories like S3 and S4? Or would you pick stories um, that are false for fact checking? And if you're, and if it is, keep in mind that you're doing the fact checking manually, so you can only fact check so many stories. So if you were to think of like, which are the stories that deserve to be fact checked? Which ones would you pick? 
highest false positive bias and false negative bias. But guess what stories would actually be reported to Facebook? They will actually be the stories that are perceived by people as being false, right? So the story that would receive the most number of false reports would be stories like S1 and S2, which are lowest along the y-axis, right? So the stories that actually S1 and S2 are the first two stories that I showed you on the previous slide. They are the stories about Barack Obama infesting um, White House with cockroaches and uh, Trump changing constitution, which none of you, most of you uh, guessed is, is wrong. Meaning it's like, a, it's, or it's almost like a sarcastic story or something like you don't say, um, when you have these satire shows or, um, uh, or comedy shows that are making fun, when you recognize that it is for fun and it, and it is actually a false thing, you don't actually need to fact check it. But those would be the stories that would be, um, that would be flagged for fact, uh, for, um, as, as, as fake. On the other hand, the problem is the more that, what is a really good fake story? One that convinces people or that people think is true. And those stories actually have less chance of being reported. And what's worse, there are considerable number of stories that people are being cynical about. That means the story S3 and S4, actually S4 was actually a true story. The national debt actually decreased. But all the AMT workers from the US, many of them didn't believe it. But then even if that story was flagged for uh, fake news, the fact checkers would, would check it as true and Facebook would do nothing with it. It wouldn't even label it. Right? Because it thinks that, well, it's a st true story, but actually it would help to label the story as true because people are not believing it. And on the other hand, the story like S3, um, which is John McCain's thing, it's actually a false story. Meaning he, he did, there is a confusion um, about um, what he actually did versus what he actually is perceived to have done. And that story has very little chance of being reported. So that is the problem. So I, um, I will just... Uh, without going too much into the next set of slides, if your goal was to actually fact check stories that have the highest false perception biases, then your goal shouldn't be to um, let people self-report and then decide based on the self-reporting, um, the number of fake false news reports you get. You shouldn't be ordering them based on that. But instead, what we, uh, what we actually show is the right way to go about it is to randomly sample a small group of readers, just as you see when you're watching YouTube ads, sometimes it says, do you want to take a few seconds to give us feedback, right? If the way we should be prioritizing uh, stories for fact checking is to take a random sample of people and ask them just to take two or three seconds. They don't have to be perfectly right, right? You just ask them for their perceptions and you look at the variance in their perceptions. And in the graphs that I have afterwards, um, what we actually show is one of the ways in which you could detect stories with highest false negative and false positive bias is by looking at how um, disputed the story is in terms of the responses from the different people. That means you look for the variance in the, in the truth perception, not just the mean, and that's the way to go about doing things. And with that, I'm going to stop here. Um, and if I have a minute or two, I'll be happy to take any questions. And if not, what do you mean by gaming? Yes. So the difference would be that um, you look for um, variance. The, so the thing is, you actually pick the sample um, that you ask for feedback. So this is the thing. Today, you're letting people report it. Whereas in the other case, you would actually select, because you know the, st the demographics of different groups of people, you would actually pick um, the people that you would ask for um, feedback. And so in that process, you can actually pick people who are leaning on different sides, and thereby you would actually add, uh, kind of circumvent that kind of adversarial attacks that you're talking about. So the proposal that we have would not be vulnerable to that kind of an attack, because Facebook would actively be ra selecting the population that it would seek feedback from, and there it would be, even if one side games it, the other side will be um, will be talk, will be reporting their perceptions in a bit more honest manner, and so this kind of gaming would be much more difficult to do if Facebook itself is asking for feedback. Yes. Yes. 
-hmm. Yes. Yes. So the way we gather the data is through survey, but if I were Facebook um, at Facebook and if I were designing the system, I would do exactly what Google is doing. So for instance, Google has these, uh, I don't know if you ever observe this when you're seeing ads once in a while it says, can you give, can you take just a few seconds to give us an option and it, it gives you like four or five different boxes and it says, do you find the ad relevant, right? So in a similar way, the interesting thing is here we only want to understand truth perceptions. We're not expecting the person to, to think deeply or do some, uh, do some research. In fact, we don't want them to do that. We want them to tell um, implicitly what they think about it, right? So in that sense, assuming that Facebook is doing it for ads, I have a feeling that maybe, fa uh, I'm sorry, Google, YouTube is doing it for its ads. I'm, uh, our thinking is that maybe Facebook could also do it for its stories when they, particularly when they start going very viral, um, it could ask, and it doesn't have to ask every single user, right? And the same user doesn't have to be given 10 different questions. In fact, they could be asked on very, very different stories. Right? One other um, comment that I just wanted to make and which is sort of the thing that we started realizing after doing this work is just think of, actually there is a, a there is very, it's very interesting to think or ask the question, what would be a fake news story that most Indians would believe or what most Bengalis would believe or what most Germans would believe? Um, and actually thinking about that question reveals a lot more about the vulnerability and belief systems of people. And actually in some of the, in one of the things that came out of this study that we didn't originally, we weren't originally thinking about was we could uniquely characterize the fake news stories that individual people would believe, right? It's almost like you can have like your uh, fake news DNA, which is the set of stories that you would stupidly believe to be true when they're actually not true kind of a thing. Because it's actually revealing something deep about um, what we think is, is instinctively right or wrong, which in turn governs a lot of other things that we do.